Yesterday, when I started very early in the morning, because uh, my flight was actually around 11, but I got anyway up very, very early, because I thought, okay, let's do this in a relaxed way. I want to have a quiet trip to get here and slowly get used to the location and everything. So then when I came to the hotel, I realized I don't have a power adapter with me. I don't have the internet working. I don't have a clicker. So everything is a little bit ad hoc now. But I love ad hoc, and i tell you in a second why that is important. Because when I, I talk to a lot of people, and especially senior managers, they say to me, hey Peter, let's do this in an agile way. Or they say, hey Peter, let's do this meeting in an agile way. Or let's, let's, do, this, um, let's do this meeting agile. And what they really mean is actually ad hoc. So for me, this is a planning continuum. I'm not sure if you guys can see this over there, but there is a planning continuum. So ad hoc means I have no plan. I have no preparation work. I just get in and I do stuff. And on the other hand, I have this big design up front where you make an exact plan. What happens when? Who does what? What happens if this fails? And everything like that. So <clears throat> this is a nice planning continuum. And if managers, especially my experience, talk about Agile, what they really mean is something along here, ad hoc. And I have a huge problem with that. So every time I hear that, I go to them and say, hey, stop. What do you really mean when you say Agile? And that's something I would highly suggest you. Make it clear that Agile doesn't mean we don't do any planning. Agile doesn't mean we do any preparation work. So where is Agile? Usually when I ask the people, it's somewhere here. Depending on what your organization is doing, it's more to the left or more to the right, but it's definitely not in the ad hoc mode. So a startup might be here. We are throwing a lot of spaghetti on the wall to find out, hey, is, is that product actually worth um, doing? Would, can we actually build that product? So a startup would be somewhere here. But if I'm working in the f with a pharma company. A pharma company is probably more here. They are dealing with a lot of regulators. They are dealing with a lot of legislations, compliance rules, and things like that. So they need to do a little bit more upfront planning. But the interesting part is that every, every organization is different. And to find that out is interesting. But Agile is definitely not here. And what I do is, if managers talk to me about that, I say to them, OK, you want to do this ad hoc stuff, then you come to me and we go every Monday to improvisational theater. Who knows what improvisational theater is? Can I see some hands? Oh, yeah, some of you. Okay. Who is playing improvisational theater? No one? Yes, one. Cool. One, two, two. Cool. Now, I'm playing also improvisational theater. And improvisational theater helps me a lot to be in that situation. So when I have no plan, no preparation work, I, I, I can somehow handle that. But there is a problem. In a business context, I don't want to be there. In a business context, I want to have a plan. I want to have some preparation work. I don't want to run meetings just ad hoc and we do stuff. And that's the huge problem when people talk about agile. <coughs> All right, um, I need someone to do the clicking. Where is, oh yeah, can you do, can you help me with the clicking? Cool, because usually I have a clicker with me, but today I don't. Can you click next? Um, these are two things that I'm really proud of. So this is a book that I've written, and there is the Software, cra software Craftsmanship Zurich community. So if you're ever in Switzerland, come say hello to us. We are getting together once a month, and we are having a lot of fun there. Um, we are doing karas, we are uh, practicing stuff, we are learning and no sharing know-how with each other. Um, next, please. Ah, oh, Nicholas is helping me out. Awesome. Now, do you remember um, a great team? Have you ever been in a great team? Who's, who would say yes? So what made that team unique? What was it? The, the people, cool. Diversity. I heard, we heard Kevin just mentioning um, women being there. Communication. Communication. History. You have a common history. Yeah, you're working together. You have tough times and you have good times. Cool. Effectiveness. Effectiveness. Cool. So you're working on stuff and you have see the impact with your potential customer. Cool. Common purpose. Common purpose. Yeah. 
Common purpose, common goal, trust, psychological safety, that's a very popular term these days. Not much pressure. Friendship, yes. Great teams build friendships. That's a great thing. Yes, celebration when you find... I, I work with a lot of different teams, and usually the first thing what I realize, if a team is doing well, is if they have inside jokes. So if they're having fun, and if, if I don't understand what they're saying, that means usually I have no idea what they're doing, that could also be the case, but usually it's also this part where, ah, they have some inside jokes, and usually that's a good thing about a great team. And yes, great team, no worries. <laughs> I want to surf the internet while I'm talking. Am I so boring? <laughs> or you want to tweet? That's fine. Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you click next? Cool. So why is that important? That is important because usually when I see teams or people, let me do the clicking because now I have a little storyline I need to build them. So we think we are the, we are the, we are like that. So we are the best. We are know what we're doing. We know the architecture. We write amazing code. This is us now. We built elegant solutions, manage the customer, and manage the project. But usually, our products look like that. Or even like that, so you even can't use it. And even we don't get the basics right. And then we work in that manner. Animated GIFs don't work, so oh, that's a sad thing. You, you know that one already? <laughs> okay, that's a popular one. Oh, that's cool. It takes too long. What the customer really needed is something completely different. And that's the challenge that also Kevlin mentioned. So customers don't really care about our architecture, about lean code or clean code, Aurelia versus React versus Vue versus whatever, Vanilla JS, whatever you're doing. So what do customers really care about? Customers care about their problem to be understood and to be solved. Now I show you a nice little model that I use uh, as well <coughs> to explain this topic, especially to, to product teams. So on this end we have built the right it. Build it right is the next Venn diagram bubble. And here we have the right time. You can think of the right time as being fast, being too, but um, being early, but you can also be too early. If I'm the only person in the world with a fax machine, I'm maybe too early. So you need to think about an audience and build up a community. But that's a separate topic. I don't want to, to dig in too much into that. Now, uh, a little tip uh, from a meta level, every time you want to um, come up being smart, draw a Venn diagram, because with Venn diagrams it's very easy to come up with smart. But that's not what I want to do now. I don't want to be smart. I want to actually con convey a message to you. And the message is obviously everyone wants to be in here. We want to build a, a product that solves a problem that the customers need. We want to build it right so we can sustain it over time, sustainable pace. We want to release a new version. We want to release further versions. And we want to hit the right time so that um, we are not too late or not too early. So we have it, the market is in place and someone is actually buying our products. What I found interesting with this model are these areas here. Now the first bit here is we are actually building the right product and we were first on the market or we were early enough on the market, but somehow every time we want to release a new version we are struggling with, with that. And this is actually the place where I work with a lot of teams. Basically, we call this also legacy code or legacy systems. So every, no every time they want to make a change, they struggle with that. Now, there is a very popular pro uh, product in that, in that field that was also documented quite well from the CTO. It's called um, Friendster. If you Google Friendster and for and CTO or blog, then you will find the documentation about it. So Friendster was a show, social media platform before Facebook and all the other ones, very early on the market, and they could not release new features. They were struggling with infrastructure, with the user base, um, with a lot of things, and just pushing out a new feature was very hard for them. And in the end, over time, they um, were taken over by other social um, media platforms. 
sad story, but it killed basically a company. And I guess that you know a couple of companies here in this region as well. <coughs> Let's look at this region here. So we are building the right it, we build it right, but we are either too late or too early. So what are products that you can imagine here? I have a very popular one that's basically the Windows Phone being way too early. I don't want to bash Microsoft, but that's a very popular one. Do you have other products in, in mind? Palm Pilot, yeah. So products that are not really absorbed by the market because they are maybe too too late or something like that. Let's look at the last one, the in another interesting one. I call this here the startup space. Startup space because we don't know yet if this idea is actually a good idea for a product. So we need to find that out. What good startups are doing, they're doing either pivoting, so pivoting is changing the product shape and direction, or they throw a lot of spaghetti on the wall and hopefully one of them sticks. So that's a, another strategy on how you can deal with that situation if you're down here. <coughs> so wh why am I telling you that model? Can you guess? A couple of reasons. One of the reasons I like this model is because it aligns very well with when you have product managers or product owners in place. So you have their kind of garden of responsibility, which is somewhere here. So product managers, product owners care a lot about that stuff here. And the, tech the engineers are over here. So development teams, that's their focus, so to build it right. Can we actually sustainably release features every week? Can we actually deploy new stuff without breaking stuff that we are too scared of? And if you, you, you have that model, you can use that also to drive a, a conversation because you can ask the product owner or the product management people, hey, are we actually here now? Should we invest more time and money here to find out if that product is actually a good idea and build quality in later? in the hope that that is actually working? I don't know. But just by having this model that, that brings this focus back again, that we need to actually invest into, um, into quality as well. <coughs> um, let me see. Did I say everything I wanted to say? I think I did. Are there any questions to this or observations? I think I wanted to say something with that model that, that doesn't come to me now. Maybe it comes later. Hey, your, your notebook makes some funny noises. No, it doesn't anymore. So what is technical excellence? I have a definition with me. So this is a minimum definition, what I see as technical excellence. Working software at the end of every sprint. Now, I'm a Scrum and XP guy, so I'm using a lot of um, Scrum terminology. And one of that is actually the sprint. So sprint means at the end of your iteration, if you're doing XP or other things. Who is able to do that? Working software at the end of every sprint. I want to see more hands. I see just, I would say, 10% of the people. So does that mean the others are not working in software and you're doing coaching, managing people or other stuff? Or Kanban, yes. But still with Kanban, I would love that you have a certain state where you say, okay, the software is now in a state where it's really done, done, done. That's still a good, good thing to think about. So that's, that's not enough, though, because we need more. Working product increment deployed on every push. Who is able to do this? And when I'm saying deployed, I mean to production, yes. Keep your hands up. Cool, yeah, I see a couple of hands. I would say 20 hands here in the room out of a thousand people. Now, how, I don't know how many we are in here, but a lot of people. Are you able to do that daily? Deploy to production? Oh, cool, let's see. And now I would like to count because that's quite interesting. I would say 10, 20 people, 20 hands. Cool, very cool. But Peter, isn't that just continuous deployment? Yes, it is. And the key on how to make that work, in my experience, is if you are able to distinguish between deployed and released. 
Now, who wants to give it a go and explain what the difference is between be deployed and released? Nicolas. Yeah, yes, yes, we're getting there. Yeah, other opinions? Yes. Yes. So it's visible by the user. And deployed is actually the change, the configuration, the code, or whatever you're doing is introduced into an environment which is um, production. And yesterday we were actually at the dinner table and one of, I think Jimmy actually mentioned that and he said that if you are able to do that, and that's also my experience, if you are able to distinguish those two somehow, you have a huge impact on how you work, on the safety, on how you deal with technology risk and things like that. Now, can you imagine ways on how to distinguish those two? Feature flags, X, that's the, the, the most obvious one. A lot of teams are using feature flags these days. Who is doing feature flags of some sort? Just to see a couple of... Uh, oh, a lot of you. I would say 50%. Cool. Now, there are two more things on how I have seen that working. Um, Another one I've seen a lot is with infrastructure, certain piece of infrastructure, usually people use load balancers or other technology to drive, okay, we deploy to production, but with a certain switch, depending on a session cookie on a HTTP header or whatever, they um, release it then basically. So that would be another option. And another option I see a lot is with a permission system. So usually in your applications, you have some sort of a uh, permission sy system and in that permission system, you create a, a, a group called alpha users or something like that. And those alpha users will always see all the features. Basically, you release it, everything to them. And the other users will, will not see it. Cool. I'm writing down permission system just for completeness and to get me some time to think about what's coming up next. Because this feels a little bit like... Oh, Conway's Law, yes. Who knows about Conway's Law? I see not so many hands. Who, who never heard of Conway's Law before? Oh, okay, so quite a lot of you, okay. So Conway's Law is the law, th f um, basically, where uh, when you design a system, it's a copy of the communication paths in your organization. Did I get that right from Wikipedia? <coughs> So that basically means if you have a certain team set up, it reflects your architecture of the, of the system that you built. I think originally he mentioned that if you have four teams building a compiler, you will have a four-step compiler. I think that's where this law actually started from. And usually you, you can see something like that. You have a couple of teams for the UI, for the middleware and the database, and obviously you have a three-tier architecture. Now, what that means is you have a relationship between a team and your architecture, which they are influenced. Now, that also means if you want to have a specific architecture, you somehow need to work on your team setup. And that also means that a certain architecture doesn't allow you to work in a certain way. If you look at that picture, basically what we see here is a layer team. And for layer teams, you have a lot of problems because when is this whole thing done? You have a lot of dependencies to manage. And then suddenly you have a lot of things in your head and that's actually a quite a hard way to work. Now, <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about the extended Conway's law. So the extended Conway's law says, um, is an invention by a friend of mine called Frederick Wendt or Richard Hunthausen. We are not sure we, uh, yet who, who actually came up with it. But basically the idea is that work or the size of the work that you give into the teams um, has an influence on the teams themselves and on the architecture themselves. So there is re a relationship between, between those three. And the 
And I saw this, I see this as a big problem, especially if you take decisions in these three topics in, ser in, in separate groups or set, um, separate, with separate uh, people. For example, if you have an architecture board and then you have a management board where they set up teams and then you have a project management office or some sort of other uh, weird things that I see in the world where they decide on the work. And if they don't talk to each other, then you have quite a problem. Now, one way to, 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 to get this better, in my experience, is if you um, shrink the deployment cadence. Because that has a, a quite an interesting, a couple of interesting effects. The first effect that I see is the work gets smaller. So I, I actually did that with, uh, with an organization in Switzerland. We went from one, one month deployments to weekly deployments. And the interesting bit there is um, people were quite relaxed because they said, okay, if we can't do it this week, we plan for it next week. And that has a huge impact on the size of the work here. On the other hand, it also had a huge impact on the focus on the, of the teams. Because you could really focus on one thing, get that thing to production and learn from it. So this deployment cadence had a huge influence on work, teams. And then we found it funny, and usually that's always the case, there is a lot of pressure that is built up on the architecture. Because usually the architecture doesn't allow to work in that manner. And that's interesting to me because you need to change your architecture. If your architecture is not allowing you to work in feature teams, let's call it like that, or in small chunks, and the architecture does not allow you to work actually in autonomous teams, you need to change the architecture. And that's where the hard part begins. This is actually related to the, to the <coughs> project paradox, call it. And the project paradox is this notion of if you compare knowledge over time and the size of knowledge that you build up, usually it goes like that. So you have knowledge that builds up over time. In the beginning, you're very new to something and you know nothing about the team, about the domain, about what we are trying to achieve. Can we actually build it? Is the infrastructure ready? How do we monitor that thing? Um, is there the customer? What, how do they behave? And things like that. So there's a lot of unknowns here. But slowly, over time, you build up the knowledge, obviously, because you learn, you get together with your team. And this is all a key essential ingredient of the software craftsmanship. We want to learn faster. And the other interesting thing that I noticed is if we look at decisions, decisions, usually it looks like that. So in the beginning, we're doing this big architecture decision. Oh yeah, we are going to use Java on the back end and React in the front end. And then there's a little API, something, something. And the authentication we're doing with that little framework and so on and so on. Now, here is a problem. Can you see the problem? We are taking the biggest decisions at the time we have, where we have the least knowledge. And that's basically stupid, if you call it. And that's actually funny. Every time I tell my girlfriend about all these things, because I get excited and I talk all about Agile at home, and she says to me, but what the fuck? I mean, that's so obvious. Why are you doing it this way? It's very hard to understand if you're not from the software world why we are behaving like that. It's funny that outsiders, if they would observe us, they probably would laugh at us. But <clears throat> so we are a lot of times in that situation. So what, what can we do? Now, one obvious thing is we could delay decisions. And that's what good architects do. They think about which decision do we need to take now? Which d decision can we delay? And, and how can we actually validate if a decision was a good one? So that's all the... the the important architecture work. And the other interesting one is we could think about how can we move our knowledge up? How can we learn faster? And that's what the two key things are in great teams. 
So great teams think about all that all the time. How can we delay decisions? Which decision we do we really need to take this week? And how can we learn faster? All right. Okay, now back to the slides. <coughs> the first thing I would um, recommend you to starting, stopping to talk about Agile. So what does that mean? This comes from Eric Evans, and I love this slide because I see this so often in Teams. So Teams use now user stories, and now it's user story everything. And basically they say something like that. As a database, I want to add a column, and as a user, I want to be locked out of the system after three incorrect password attempts. What the hell is going on? As a user, I want a button so that I can click the button, things like that. So this is completely... BS, obviously, and stop doing this, yeah. And the other thing is, I hear, I hear a lot of things like, ah, the safe book says this, ah, this is not XP, ah, but Scrum, and all this thing. And I would love that people start to more think about, especially when we talk about this model here. Where is the customer? What's valuable to him? Um, how can we get more of customers? Um, how can we uh, return, uh, increase our retention rate? How do we make money with that product? Who is actually paying for that? Um, that would be much more interesting. So the question, how do we become more agile, is actually not a good one. It's more about how can we discover and deliver value faster. Now there's a challenge with value, and Kevlin actually mentioned that already. Value sounds very fluffy, like, yeah, what is it? Is it money in my pocket, or what is value? And I give you free resources, and these are resources that you need to do as homework. So um, there's something you have to do on Sunday. Basically, there is this evidence-based management guide that comes from scrum.org, and they give you 12 or 15 um, value metrics. So things to consider when you're measuring value. So it's, it's all about quantification. And I give you uh, two more tips. Don't measure just one and measure a trend. What's the customer satisfaction rate now? Does it go up, does it go down, and things like that. <coughs> so, great teams talk and focus on value and not on output. So no story points, no hours, all the things that Kevlin just mentioned. And even better teams, they deliver value. And we discover a, a way to, to, to see that with that model, because you could deploy very often, you can deploy every change to production, and that's a good thing if you're able to do, with quality gates and everything in your pipeline. But releasing something to the customer could be on demand. And that's also interesting, because suddenly you can run experiments. Think of A-B testing, think of what happens if I do release this feature to this customer base, what happens if, if I release this feature to this customer base. This, you get a lot of feedback and that's also valuable. And great teams will focus on that. These are the three more metrics that I can give you. So there are the Pirate metrics and the Google's Heart, which are some UX metrics. Does the mouse work here? Yes. So I'm not opening up these URLs because I don't know what's happening there. So <coughs> what we else developers or engineers need to do, though, I think, I, I, I would say, though, is start investing in quality. Starting investing in quality is making sure that we don't go into this direction too much and we forget about quality and we are not able to deliver a product every month or every week or so. So that's what we need to do. So how are we going to do that? The bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. That's the challenge with quality. And I have a little other model that I show you in a second, and that is this one. And I have experienced that a lot of times. And that model goes like this. So over time, the number of features decreases. Who has been in this situation? Who has been in this situation? Not so many. Who has never been in this situation? One, two, three. Cool. That's great if you're able to do that. <coughs> um, what I see teams when they are in this situation, not just the number of features goes down, but also the happiness of the dev team goes down. 
in the beginning we are starting a new project everything is easy everything is green um, how do you say the green projects where you start from scratch everything is easy then you just start up spin up new infrastructure in the cloud and suddenly though everything gets harder ah oh, this feature is always broken the libraries are out of date and things like that the challenge though is we are still eight hours in the office so what happens what happens with our time? What are we doing down here? Bug fixing, yeah? Refactoring, yes, refactoring. Refactoring is here. We call this fighting complexity. So complexity builds, builds up in your architecture, in your code base, in your whatever it is. And you're fighting that. And then over time, you're spending more time fighting complexity than actually delivering value. And that's a place where you don't want to end up, obviously. Now, what could you do in order to not end up here? Hmm? Link code and then... Um, yes, I remember Kevin mentioning sleeping a lot, and um, what was the other one? Having a having women on the team and um, low stress levels. But I think that's not enough. I think that's definitely good. Sleeping is is definitely very important. Hmm? Ah, yes, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Throw everything away and we start again. So we are back here. Yeah, that's also a strategy. Could can work. No, would not suggest to do that. Or you leave the company, then yeah, that's their problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, so I see you are very creative. That's good. As developers, we are always very creative to fix problems. But that's let's assume we don't want to run in this direction. Now I have another option. The other option is we fight complexity all the time. Some people call that continuous refactoring. Some people call that merciless working in on quality. But the idea is you invest into quality all the time in order to keep up with this pace. The sad thing, though, is at the beginning you're going to be slower, at least perceived from the business. So the business says, why is everything taking so slow? But that's not a problem because you, can, you have an argument now. You can say, hey, we are so slow because we want to keep up with that pace for a long time. And hopefully the product is successful, so we want to release a new version and we want to have copy customers for a long time. <coughs> now, <coughs> I'm a big fan of all these models. Now, I've, I've drawn you five or six different models. Um, and as you know, all models are wrong, but some of them are hel helpful. Now, let's dig a little bit further into this and how you actually do this. Now, I've seen three strategies on how to do this. The first one, which I would recommend, is ha give the team a budget. So give the team a budget for the time where they're doing fighting complexity. Just to, and I remember, uh, just um, remind you again what that means. Fighting complexity includes improving our whatever we are doing. Architecture, monitoring, deployment strategies, pipelines, clean code, refactoring, everything is included here. So giving a budget means that we give them certain days or certain time or two, two developers a whole week or something, and you plan that into your sprints. That's one strategy. The second strategy, you give the business only a number of features. Basically say to the business, hey, um, every sprint, you can only get, give us five features or two features. That would be the other strategy. And I have a seen a third strategy, which I would not recommend. The first strategy is basically where you put all these, these um, technical work into the features up above. But the problem there is you're hiding basically the complexity in the features themselves, and the features get bigger. So the third strategy I would not recommend. It. I would actually recommend you the first one. Have a certain budget for the team where they can fix and do their technical work. That works quite well in my experience. <coughs> now, <coughs> I'm not a big fan of um, technical debt. Kevin Henney, he mentioned that technical debt as a term. Um, I, I don't use that anymore, especially with business people. I try to avoid it because there are two big problems. 
and Kevin actually mentioned them. The first problem with technical debt is that business, business people, when they hear debt, they think, oh, that's a good thing, because I can buy something which I probably could not afford. So I can buy a big house, I get a loan somewhere, and I can think about the payments later. And that's a, an analogy I don't like. And the second one is, in my experience, technical debt doesn't accumulate linear, linearly. So you can't calculate, oh, we spend just a couple of minutes every day and then everything will be fine. Because technical debt, all these shortcuts that we're doing in our architecture and in our landscape, they are, um, they are slowing us down in a non-exponentially way, or actually in, a, in an exponential way. And you can't calculate that upfront. But with technical debt, you can calculate that. You can say, if I get a million euro now, and I pay then a lot of money every month, somehow in 25 years I will be at zero. That's something you can calculate with technical debt. Uh, sorry, with, with financial debt. With technical debt, that's not possible. You don't know, if you're doing this shortcut now, how much it will slow you down in the future. And that's the, the thing why I don't use the, the term technical debt anymore. All right. What are we going to do regarding timing? How much time do I have? Cool. So I will talk to you about how can we actually turn this knob up a little bit and how can we actually slow down our teams? What would you suggest? How can we slow down our teams? The last time I asked this question, I heard someone, we just delete the GitHub repository. Yes, that's an option. Uh, don't be so evil. <laughs> what other options do we have? Make them reflect. Yeah, make them reflect a lot. So they are just doing retrospectives without doing actual work. Yes. Tree hugging and having... Have, have more meetings. Yes, yes. That's always a good one. Spend more time in meetings. Pay them less. Pay them less. Yes, yes, that's an interesting one. I have to think about that one a bit more. <laughs> yeah, interesting spread. Oh yeah, fire half of the robbers. That could also be a good thing. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So in my experience, um, this is a good strategy: how to slow down your team. And now you can actually see that on the. On the, on the. So this is. Um, an old project I was working with and you can immediately see that this is not nice code. And one strategy on how I see that immediately, and I also teach that business people, if you turn your head 90 degrees and you see here a nice um, hilly landscape that reminds me of m the place where I'm from, I'm coming from South Tyrol, from the Alps, that's a nice, nice place to be, but you should not have that in your code base. In the code base, you should have a, a nice flat territory, hopefully. So writing crappy code is a great strategy to slow down your teams. But why do we do that? Why do we write bad code? Deadlines. Deadlines. Time pressure. Work harder, work harder, yes? Definitely, that's a very good one. Legacy code. Legacy code, yes. That's actually one of my first points as well. Because everything is already broken, just adding another little if statement there uh, doesn't really... Yeah, good one. So I have a couple of hypotheses for this bad code. The so first one is broken window theory, and I think everyone knows that one. Who, how many have seen or heard about the broken window theory? Okay, who has not heard about the broken window theory? Okay, quite a lot, so 50%. You need to read that up on the internet. So that's homework for you, that's something you need to do um, when you come home. So we write bad code, that's the second hypothesis. We write bad code because we read bad code. We have never seen good code. So one strategy here is actually to see, to read a lot of good code. Um, when you have a lot of good code, you have a lot of code that is easy to maintain and easy to change. And c code readings, there are a lot of strategies here. Code reviews, pair work reviews, mob programming, pair programming, yeah, that's something that is very popular these days. And who is doing open source in some sort? Maintaining open source, contributing open source? Not so many, I would say 20 hands, okay? That's definitely a great way to find out, getting feedback on your code bases and learn about what is good code and what not. 
So a couple of tips for code reviews. It's all about the code, not about the person. Um, review not only code, review also the tests, the build process, everything that is in your work environment that helps you to grow and become better as a team. Now there's also a funny animation here, but the animation somehow doesn't work. But probably when you get the slides later on, you can look at it. And that helps you to grow as a team, the code reviews. So instead of, hey, this must be John's code, I don't like this, this is ugly, um, I hate this, I reviewed the code, I deleted it. The, 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 the one tip you can take out of this presentation is just ask questions. If you just ask questions, everything will be better. Now, pair programming, this is how pair programming looks like. <laughs> Who is doing pair programming? <laughs> Is this how you do pair programming? Yeah. Kind of, okay. So pair programming is something I really enjoy, especially when I heard about the tip from Llewellyn Falco, and he has this tip of doing it. Oh, there is another little animation. I skip over that. Um, he calls this strong style pair programming. Strong style pair programming is this um, notion of pair programming where an idea from your head into the computer it needs to go through someone else's hands. So the one that is sitting at the front of the computer is actually not allowed to think. He's just receiving. And then it's all about communication. We heard in the keynote already that communication is very important. And with strong style pair programming, you raise the level of communication in your team a lot. And you learn a lot about that. So that's a, a hot tip I can suggest to try out at home. Mob programming, I skip over that because I think everyone has heard or came across about that. So let's go a bit faster. I have a couple of URLs here, so if you um, get the, uh, the slides later on somehow via the organizers or somehow via my tweet, I will tweet the slides later on, you will find all the links and, and the links there are is homework and there is also good code bases where you can get inspired from. Good code is like a joke, you don't need an explanation because it's so obvious. <coughs> Third hypothesis is back at, nobody can write good code in one sitting. There is no write the first time. What does that mean? We need to do a lot of refactoring. So there's this refactoring practice that is very important, and that's also something you need to practice. And here are two co very great code bases. Can I just see some hands? Who, know, who knows, knows about the Gilded Rose refactoring kata? Three, four, five. That's a very good one, just to practice um, refactoring. It helps you to understand what is ugly, what is not ugly. Strategies on how to apply the refactoring is um, really awesome. Well, so what's the problem with refactoring, though? The problem with refactoring is, if you don't have any tests in place, then it's like an adventure that is not going to end well. So you need to have tests. Without tests, refactoring is an adventure without a happy end. We don't want to have suicide, yes. <laughs> Very scary. We don't want to have to have that. Now, when I ask business people, now, what if you combine these things together, refactoring and tests, what is that? And business people say, stop doing that. There is no value in that. There is no features, nothing. So... If you talk to, to business people about that, so they would say, no, that doesn't make sense. But if you talk to developers, they realize, I'm refactoring and tests. What is that actually? That is TDD. And TDD is not the word that Kevin just mentioned up there, um, this word named tropoic disorder something. Traumatropism. Yep. So TDD stands for test-driven. Design, development, I don't know. It depends. It depends who you ask. And what I think is key though, and I, and I mentioned that here on the slide, is the think. So the think step before. Because usually developers, when I work with them, they want to just get started to work on the code. But to me, it helps you a lot to have a little whiteboard session. Let's think about where, where we are getting with all this. What's the domain in here? What are they we trying to model here? And then we have a design step where we try to think of what's the future state we want to have. Failing test, see it fail, refactor, do the minimum, and things like that. And <coughs> to me, uh, a, a very important topic, and that's why I have a separate slide. I'm not, I don't need to draw you that on the flip chart. 
is this notion of TDD outside in. Because usually we have different worlds where we live in, and also Kevlin men mentioned that. We have um, the business world, and they have a certain idea in their heads. So we have the business people, we have the ops people, we have the UI people, we have engineers, we have process engineers, we have a lot of people in organizations. And if they talk all their own language, and if that language is not reflected in the code base, as you can see here, as a dev team, you need to do a lot of mapping. And all these mappings, they cause a lot of friction. And I think that's the major source for bugs. Because if this business people is talking to me with account IDs, I need it to map into, ah, this is actually the customer ID or account number. And all these mappings that I need to keep up in my head, they cause a lot of friction and a lot, a lot of potential bugs. So TDD outside in is the only way to go. And what I think about TDD, it's really about, it's a thinking driven, thinking technique. It's about how I approach a problem. That's also described in this book from Stephen R. Covey. He says basically, begin with the end in mind. And that's what TDD is about. So what's the final state, what we are trying to achieve? Write a test there. And then you realize, ah, oh, that's too big. So make it smaller. So what's a minimum test we can write? And slowly we are tapping into this world of where we're actually driving production code. A couple of links where you can practice this. Obviously, I mentioned the Software Craftsmanship Zurich community where we get together once a month, where we also practice this. So I have four last tips for you, and I think I don't have time, but so I will rush quickly through them. So I have four things for you. If you are in that situation over there, all fine, but we are here. So four things that worked very well for me. The first one is proper root cause analysis, and this is very, very hard in my experience. So the first step there is gather data on the sprint board. So basically, every feature, every bug that is finished, you gather the root cause, why did it make so slow, what's the root cause of this bug, things like that. So at the end of the done column, you have a column called learned. How could this bug have been prevented? The second step you do, you cluster all these, and then you do a deep dive with the team. You can do that the whole team or you give it to certain people and you say, hey guys, you need, really need to find out what happened here. Is there something in the Java runtime? What happened on Friday on this cluster over there? Can you reproduce that problem? Dive deep. And that's very hard in my experience because as, we met, as we've seen in Kevin's talk, there is a lot of stuff behind the Java runtime, then some of them are there, and there is silicium somewhere, and there's a data set somewhere. So dive, digging down this, this hole is very important. And the last, and the previous last point is, how can we actually prevent this in the future? So what can we do to that this is not happening again? And the fifth step is maximize learning. So maximize learning as an individual, as a team, and as an organization. That would be proper root cause analysis. And I don't see that often enough in my experience. And the three other ones, do you have a definition of done, obviously? So getting to done is a key. Do you have a definition of done on your board? It's clear when we say done, that means this certain step. And maybe it means deployed to production. That would be a good step if you have that. And even release to the users, even better. The third step is going small. So this is a concept also from extreme programming. Basically, it's called swarming, where you s the whole team swarms around one feature. And basically, you bring that to production all together. So go small. And that was one of the workshops I ran just recently, where th there was the major aha moment for them. It's much more important to have a clear definition of done. We have a clear stability over just having a lot of features that we are almost ready, almost done, and things like that. And the zero bug policy, that's a concept that maybe you, some of you guys have heard before. Who has heard of zero bug policies? I see 20 hands, roughly. So one of the ideas there is write a failing test for every bug. So before you actually fix the bug, write a failing test that reproduces that problem, and then you see it fail, and then you fix the bug. This is, again, in my experience, quite hard, especially if you have a lot of infrastructure, if you have a lot of shakiness, if you have a lot of things in your architecture that are broken. But that's also a good thing, because that tells you, hey, fix that problem. So how do you sell that to managers? Talk to them about an investment. So well-crafted and tested code is expensive. Yes. 
but fixing bad code is very, very, very expensive. So what would you rather do? Let's invest quality up front and have a product that we can sustainably deliver, release on demand all the time and earn money, hopefully. Or do we want to throw spaghetti on the wall and hope for the, hope for the best or do even a rewrite sooner or later? So that's something you can talk to your manager. Now you, first thing that I want to, to mention again is be fit, be ready. Basically practice. So practice all these practices, learn from it, learn yourself, learn in the team, learn in the organization. That's a key aspect, I think. We don't have a knowledge problem, we have really a practice problem. Knowledge is there, everyone knows almost everything. We know all the tools, the infrastructures and everything. But when we are really in the field and we need to do our work, then we struggle. Okay, how do we approach this? How do we slice this smaller? Things like that. And the second thing that I want to end up with is what hinders you to add to your definition of done, deployed to production? And usually, ah, there is a release manager somewhere. Ah, there is a release management meeting. Ah, there is a documentation. Uh, ah, there is something. Fix that problem. It sounds very easy. It's very hard, though. Um, what about if you release to 10% of your users? What about if you have in the definition of done release to all? Because then suddenly you can do something like that. You can say um, this metric X increased by a certain amount of percent for customer segment Z. And now that's quite cool because then you can really measure in production the effect of your features. And that's what we want to have with technical excellence. My plan was actually to run now a Q&A session for the next hour. <laughs> How does that plan work out? I think that does not work out at all. But anyway, you can go to that URL if you want to. And you can vote on questions there. You can send me questions there, and what I will do is I will actually blog on them, or I will answer them on Slack, or we can have a conversation in the coffee table later on, and things like that. But that was, would be part of my, my job. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you got a little bit out of it. Um, I hope you found these models helpful to talk to your teammates and in the organization, and I see you at the conference somewhere outside. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>